RDM films, so and will be shown on public access TV, but we know not when. YouTube tonight. YouTube tonight, there you go. Maybe we can all get together and watch ourselves. If there's any public comment, we'll take that now, but public is also welcome to chime in up when we come to the specific topic, if that makes more sense to you. We're much more informal with that. So that'd be fun. So is there anybody public comment or wants to wait? Okay. Uh, first item on the agenda are the minutes from the June 23rd meeting. Move approval. Do second. I hear a second? second? Second. Any discussion? We have a little bit of amendment. I provided a few comments to BJ, mm -hmm. mainly minor edits. Minor edits? Minor edits. So, okay. Have people seen those edits or do you think they're necessary to? I don't think they're necessary. Okay. Anybody? It's over there. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, so uh, all in favor of approval of the minutes? Aye. 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 Opposed? Um, so it looks like we're on the agenda. We have new business before old business. Is, is that okay to, to do? We'll start with the new and go to the old. Um, so this is the first item there is the discussion of art on the crosswalks. And Terry, your name is my guy. So, so, so. Um, so as you all know, we the Board of Public Works approved the Rainbow Crosswalk back in May. Um, and in June, late June, another woman came forward, Kathy Osborne, uh, asking, suggesting that we should have a red, white, and blue crosswalk from Pulaski Park over to Fresh Pasta. And think it, th presenting it as a, a great idea for Veterans Day. Um, and our first reaction as a board was to hold back. We, we realized we have, we have no process in place and the first one sort of just sailed through, but getting the second request made us realize that there could be a, a chain of these requests. Um, so we asked her to hold off while we worked on the process. And in fact, at that meeting, we said, it'll come up at this meeting where we can start getting wider input from the community. Uh, Shortly thereafter, the mayor called me, and I was on the phone with the mayor and Alan Seawall, who suggested that a better way to approach it would be for us to say okay to the Kathy Osborne, seeing as we had made no prior announcement of any intent to develop a policy, but simultaneously declare a moratorium and any further requests until we do, in fact, have a policy. So the BPW on the 16th of July approved that, basically that idea. So Kathy is at this point moving forward with the staff, I believe. Is that true? I haven't seen anything from Kathy yet. Okay, but but she's free to do so. Right. Yes. She sent she sent a proposal. How did I get that? You you you're, I think just, you're the man. Proposal came. <laughs> 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 I don't I don't. I, I saw a proposal too. Okay. I think it might have come to everybody on this committee. Maybe it went to. Okay. Yes, Mary, do you, did you happen to get, you get also, did you get something from a proposal? <coughs> well, we were we were given something before the the board meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. She, she did a handout. So that might, have, that might have been the same okay. thing you received. Yeah. So. There needs to be some discussion back and forth. We need to finalize an amount of paint. Right. But the intent is that we will right. treat her request the same as we treated Melinda Shaw's request. I think that was a... Yeah. Um, meanwhile, all right, so, so that's where it was. We have declared a moratorium and um, accepting any further requests until such time as we develop the policy. Uh, another related incident or issue in the interim is that we've been asked by the state to paint, so that the crosswalk is like this. They've asked us to paint transverse lines on either side of the crosswalk. Um, to, for, to more clearly delineate this crosswalk. Mm -hmm. So that's where it lies. The intent to bring it to you, th th there, there are two sort of parallel sets of issues. One issue is working out with the Transportation and Parking Commission and the State Highway Department what would be an acceptable format for a, a decorated crosswalk. That's, 
that seems clearly within the purview of the BPW. It's something we can figure out. The other piece is what we would prefer not to be in charge of saying, yes, that seems like a worthy crosswalk. No, that seems to not meet some vague criteria. We would like to draw some, if this even goes forward, it's possible this whole thing may not be a good idea. But if it does go forward, we'd like to draw some other part of the city's government, the Arts Council, the City Council, the Mayor's Office, somebody, in to make the determination that, yes, this seems like a worthy scheme, this crosswalk, work with these people, in which case we say, great, here are the criteria, here are the, the specifics of what needs to happen. Uh, is this permission in perpetuity, for example, or is it for six months? Do we charge you for the paint and also for the effort necessary later on to remove the paint? You know, we, we can figure out those technical details. We would prefer, as I say, to have someone else decide, mm -hmm. yes, work with these people. Awesome. Um, I've, I've heard you when you spoke about how you got to this point, but I'm still unclear how, how it happened that none of these questions were discussed until it was the American flag crosswalk was proposed. Because, for example, I remember members of the public, including Mark Warner and Claudia Lefko, saying that there might be, that there's an ordinance that perhaps is, that um, is already governs this issue. And it seems like, as far as I can tell from reading the Gazette coverage, the board didn't think that that was an issue at the time somehow. So um, I'm just wondering how, after the American flag issue, the American flag cross for trust work, there was then, you know, these questions about, you know, are we making political statements? Um, and, and particularly, whether or not there's already the, or, the ordinance that, that I wrote last year, whether or not that applies. I mean, again, that was brought up by the public, by members of the public, very publicly, at council meetings, letters. It was public paper. art, the public <coughs> art. Which ordinance? The public, the public art ordinance, the right. public art ordinance. Um, there were letters to the editor, so I'm just I'm just curious how that I mean, how that was disregarded until the American fr fr cr uh, flag crosswalk proposal came about. So could someone? The tell the, me the initial rainbow crosswalk happened fairly quickly. There was a kind of a tight timeline on that. The idea came up shortly before the gay pride parade. This was in May, and and to be sure, we didn't dig into it any further. In no time at all, in June, someone else came forward with a request. There just wasn't, there was a lot going on right in that period. Well, I, I think um, some of the confusion lies around whether or not the back painting crosswalks is in fact public art. art. Yeah. And I think that a decision needs to be made, whether it be by this body or in consultation with the Arts Council, in consultation with the City Council, I don't know, but I think that's a decision that has to be made. When Claudia Lefko came forward and complained about the process around the, um, the uh, rainbow, cro rainbow Crosswalk, it was specifically um, because they had requested to paint speed humps with art. Art, not political statements, not group affiliated statements, but art. So I think we're talking about two different things, and we just have to make a decision about how we define what public art is um, and whether or not, in fact, painted crosswalk walks are I public respond art. To that directly, well, please, let's just see if Mike is responding to the same thing. Are you on this topic or should Jesse? I was going to respond to Jesse's question about how did this all happen. Okay, go ahead and do that. And so, I, the issue came to the board and we made a decision in one meeting. So I think the public input, I don't have a real clear recollection, but I think the public input came after we made our decision. And so um, we were, but, but we'd already committed to the crosswalk, but we are, we then in recognition, partly in recognition of the public comment and the, re and the realization that this was probably a much broader issue than just one crosswalk, that's why we, when the second request came, we decided to regroup. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I, I encourage everyone to read the ordinance because what it says is that the Arts Council will determine what art is because that's why they exist. 
and because there have been other projects in the city, or at least I can think of a project where the Arts Council had no say in it, and some members of the community thought that it wasn't a good piece of art, which is part of the reason why I created the ordinance. And part of my concern is that, well, for one, that law already governs that issue, and, for, and the second thing is, they were never consulted. So I mean, we could. I mean, there certainly could be confusion about what art is, but the fact of the matter is, the Arts Council was never consulted. So. Can I just address that? Because I, I do see, I'm not disagreeing necessarily, but I could see how a group would look at an American flag or symbols and say, this is different than art. I, because my own sense, having been on that arts committee when we discussed this before the ordinance way back, was the same. I always assumed it would be like art. And I could, I could certainly have also made that same misjudgment, perhaps, of thinking that whether it was the American flag that first came first or my birthday painted with my my initials on the crosswalk of saying, these are symbols, this is not an artistic expression. I, I could see your point as well. But what I'd like to know is, how is it, I think now the question is how we're moving forward and what people think of that process. And so if we could move to that, and if you have a statement well, on that, here, here, would be here's, here's what I have to say about it, is that if, if the Arts Council isn't, you know, if, if the Arts Council isn't asked if it's art, then the Board of Public, Work, the Board of Public Works, in this case, decides that itself. That's they're, then they're deciding what art is. If they if they if, if well, they, if they say, that again? but hold on, if, let me just finish the point because I think I get to where you asked me to go forward. Um, so I think what has to happen is if the board, if the arts council decides that that these things are art, then then they need to then then these projects need their approval. But then what if they're not art? Well, then I think there needs to be a process for that too. Then if these are if they if we choose to allow these things at all. Because the Arts Council may very well say, this is our criteria, it's outside of our criteria. We don't have any purview over this. So I think if, if, if something is art, and the Arts Council has to be asked whether or not it is, well, then it has to go through the process. But if not, then we need another process. What, what, okay. I had a number of calls. My calls, not one were about people who were upset and wanted, not one call was about the art piece of it. It was about the political statement and wanting to make another political statement. So to my mind, I would not be comfortable moving this to the Art Council, except as a secondary thing, saying we don't want even a political symbol to be unattractive. There, you know, We may need something. But I would not have the Arts Council be the primary person, because then you're confusing kind of the political statement, where I don't want the Arts Council involved, with the artistic statement, and then forcing them to make that decision. I um, sit on the, the Transportation and Parking Commission, and it came to us, and what we were looking at was safety. And um, none of us thought of it as art. We thought of it as kind of political, politicized symbolism. And um, so it didn't come to mind. I'm very familiar with your ordinance. I just never would have thought of those, that kind of statement, a rainbow flag or an American flag, for that matter, as art per se. I do agree, though, that there is another. There are other kinds of requests that, that are going to come forward, like Claudia's, that they want to paint art on um, speed bumps or crosswalks. And in that case, I do think that the Arts Council needs to be involved. So I am suggesting that we have to figure out the differentiation between art and political symbols. Make a decision about political symbols. That's what seems to be to me to, me to be the most important piece. The other piece is that we do have to have a step where everything comes to the TPC because there are safety issues. We um, we shifted the design of the rainbow so that it would have interspersing white uh, stripes because we read the national and state guidelines about crosswalks that said, in fact, in order for it to be considered ultimately the safest it could be, it has to have those white lines. So that's the kind of oversight that the TPC needs to have. So there does need to be that step. And that doesn't address the arts piece, but I think that's really important. Just one last comment. I, I'll just, this is my own personal feeling. I, I think you've done a good process here. I think to approve of the second the American flag, I think was right. If I was involved in this, I would actually put a, I, I would put an end to this. I actually think to have crosswalk after crosswalk painted, I think these are political symbols. Again, the discussion that I heard was about the political statements wanting to be made. And I think we're opening up a whole other avenue for where do you draw the line on political statements? Because then it comes to your question of, well, if it's artistic statement, that's very different. OK, we're going to paint all our crosswalks. That's a whole other question, in which case I would agree with you. 
But I would like to not have like one crosswalk after another, and then we say, okay, but this is where we draw the line. I, I think it's a very tricky place. I think we'll be spending a lot of time. Most of the calls, so you guys can help me. I'm, this is just you know what I heard. I did get a number of calls, probably because I'm chair of this committee, and somebody told me to call me. I would say most of the calls said, I wish we had never done this at all, but if we're going to do it, and I'm not against the crosswalk that was done, but I want an American flag, but I wish we had never done it. Most people just would rather not have anything done. So that's just my own personal opinion. I'm very glad to go. And yeah. My public comment is, as a person who more often than not is walking across the crosswalk, I think, so it's great to have them be repainted, especially all of them. But I think they're more noticeable when people go, well, what is that? They're paying attention. They notice there's a crosswalk there. So I for a safety issue, you think it's better? I, I, think, I think having them painted, um, I agree that we should probably be overly cautious about political statements, because there's a certain point at which it's going to offend too many people. Uh, but I do think that having them multicolored and even having some sort of theme where people can look at it and see what it is makes them more visible. I don't think that it's, would, I think it would be gratuitous if we did the whole city, but I certainly think the whole central business district should have colorful crosswalks, especially if other people are paying for it. Any other comments? Just comments? Yes, um, I just want to let Terry know um, I want to thank you for letting me know about the decision that was made, I guess, what, in June after, because I did attend the first meeting, and I did see it on the agenda, and that's why I came to that meeting. I met Kathy, her and I had a lovely talk. I think she was as respectful as could be for what she was asking for. Um, I think because there was not a process, and then she comes in, and being told that there was not a process was not very nice. To me, I would have felt like being slammed. And that should not be happening because you want trust no matter what board it is. And her and I had some lovely talks together on the phone after that last meeting. And even in the paper, I had to say what I had to say. I felt that because of one sidewalk being painted a rainbow, which I agree 100%, I love it, that she should be treated the same way and a moratorium be placed after her request. And I have to agree with Councilor Spector and also with Councilor Alyssa Klein. I think it's a very tricky thing here because you are looking at the political part of it, the art part of it, and I agree with Councilor Spector. I think that we should look at this very carefully are we going to continuously go ahead and grant these? So a question in, as we move forward is, where would the right place for the, discuss, the further discussion be? Does this go to transportation parking? Does it go to the Arts Council? Does it go to everybody? Do we, does it come here again? This was just the beginning of that discussion. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the questions is, do we agree with the moratorium piece to give us some time to move forward, that would be something. Yeah. Well, I think you know there's been some conversation about maybe we should just stop this because it is a slippery slope, and so I think that to suggest that maybe we table it, put a moratorium on it, moratorium on it, revisit it in three to six months, but um, park it there. Okay, that's one. I think we need to come to a decision how we're going to go forward. I mean. I think just a moratorium doesn't really answer any questions. I mean, and I, I don't oppose a moratorium, but unless there, I hope that if we impose one, there's going to be a point where we take it up and come to some decisions on this. Do you think we should take it up here? Or should it go? Um, I think we should take it up again. I mean, I do. Um, okay. But we being this you committee or we I mean, this committee, this, committee. Just, just this joint committee. But sometimes not. Why do we? 
if we uh, want to, were you looking for some, the moratorium is something you can just do, correct? You don't it's, need it's this done. committee or our it's done. moratorium is So in place. how about we move this and we put it on the agenda for our next meeting as well, and we continue this discussion. <clears throat> and meanwhile, Ned has done quite a bit of research into uh, the fact that we were called by the Mass Highway okay. about putting the transverse lines down means they're paying attention to this, and okay. they have given Ned quite a bit of guidance about um, w where the various rules sit at the moment. Um, it looks as though if we wanted to do it, it's technically feasible to do it from their point of view, as long, but they have some constraints around that. Okay, um, so before we go into that, maybe we, we can put it on the agenda, because if we come up with the idea, which one possibility is, we stop at two. It may not be, maybe we go for a lot more, but let's move this and we'll put it on the agenda where it can be a fuller discussion at the next meeting. Yeah. And, and maybe if we could circulate Ms. Osborne's proposal, just because someone would be great. Here a proposal Good idea. Idea. Uh -huh. Okay. If you find that before I do, if you can send it to the rest of us, I that'd be it. great. Could yeah. you send that to all of us? <coughs> I, I got it already, but send it to me. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is that okay with everyone if we move this and put it on the agenda for our next yeah. meeting? I have one more. Sure. I wonder if the business owners on either end of any new crosswalk that's being done should be consulted to see if they think it might impact them. I, I had a few calls, but we might do that in a more uh, organized fashion. Good point. So mm -hmm. I'll walk around. Take an informal survey. Okay. Good idea. Okay. Next item: um, discussion of the future of the hotel bridge. <laughs> Sounds very exciting. It's a hotel bridge. So, a hotel bridge is something that everyone needs to see. We have two people here to offer public comment. I have a letter um, from a resident that wasn't able to be at the meeting, so I might just launch with the letter. Sure. We'll give a little bit of background. I have my own notes and things I wanted to share. We have a bridge in Leeds um, that crosses the Mill River. It's, uh, it's a fairly rare iron truss bridge that is, has been closed at this point to all traffic, including pedestrian traffic. Um, the Lead Civic Association for many years has been trying to raise funds to have it restored. There's a whole long history that I can share with you. Um, Sue Carbon is here, Penny Geis is here, they'll give you a little bit of the history too. I'm going to read George Kohaus, um, a former resident of Leeds his letter about it, and he's been working on this for a long time. Um, Dear board members and staff of the Department of Public Works, due to my work schedule, I'm unable to appear in person for this discussion, but I would like to add my support to the topic on the agenda regarding the hotel bridge in Leeds. Although I'm currently a resident of State Street in Ward 1, I previously lived in Leeds for 25 years and have been active in the efforts to rally support for the restoration of the hotel bridge. There are two critical reasons for the BPW to also support the efforts to restore the bridge to a level that can accommodate 24-7 pedestrian traffic. As one of the few and the oldest iron truss style bridges in Massachusetts, it would be a sad note for the city, for a city that so values its history to have the bridge remain in its current condition or witness it deteriorate even more over the coming years. The Hotel Bridge not only represents an important hallmark of the late 18th century industrial might of Northampton, but also honors the city's forefathers who had the foresight to contract for such an enduring and graceful iron structure. A secondary but no less important role of the bridge is its function in the city's multimodal transportation network that we're all so proud of. The use of the bridge by pedestrians and bicyclists as an access point to and from Leeds Village and neighboring conservation areas and towns should not be discounted and is valued by residents throughout the city and the region. As a past member of the Northampton Planning Board and Community Preservation Committee, I am well aware of the competing needs for the city in the city and the DPW's fiscal and staff resources. However, I would suggest that keeping the restoration of the Hotel Bridge project front and center on the DPW's project list is a priority. We know that to prevent the bridge from being closed permanently, a large investment of time, resources, and energy needs to be shared across the city. In the wings is a committed volunteer committee representing all wards of the city willing to actively partner with the DPW in the areas of research, grant writing, and fundraising to support the project. I look forward to continuing the discussion with the board related to next steps in restoring the hotel bridge to its value role in our city. So can we do public 
comment for sure, that yes. and then I'll share some of my own thoughts. Okay. Um, maybe Ned or somebody could answer it on the board. I thought that the previous counselor, Tacy, had brought that to city council and had talked about the bridge and that they were working on that, of trying to get the funds and so forth like that. But my husband was born and raised on Water Street. The family has tons of pictures of that bridge, and I am in full support of them getting somehow the money and the funds to restore that bridge and open it back up. I used to walk on it with my husband. Uh, many children used to ride their little bicycles on that, people walking, cars. I mean, something needs to be done. But I do know that the other counselor from Ward 7 had brought that up about raising money and restoring it. Ned, maybe before you go to, is, was there um, some research done on how much this would cost, or did that come yeah, up in the was. last? There was mon money granted to Lead Civic and DPW to have an engineering evaluation of the bridge done. And their first estimate to repair the bridge fully and restore it with a wooden deck was $1.5 million. Which many think is actually high. Mm -hmm. And was that for both vehicular and no. pedestrian yeah. traffic? Pedestrian. Just pedestrian. Okay. But I think that the two folks yes. that are here can answer a lot of the questions. Mm -hmm. okay. So who goes first? Um, <laughs> well, we love it. That's what yeah. I'm here to say. Mm -hmm. We love this bridge, and we don't want to see it uh, fall into the river mm -hmm. or go away. Um, there are many practical reasons. Um, as a matter of fact, when the tree fell um, on the other bridge and closed that end off, a lot of people realized on Water Street that, you know what, that hotel bridge is important. If we could just walk off it, if there was something that happened on Water Street that we couldn't get out on, on the one bridge, we could at least walk across the, the hotel bridge. So that was important. That piece right there for safety is important. But also, um, it is a very historic structure, as Lisa spoke to. It's the probably oldest Pratt II Trust in the state of Massachusetts. And we are dedicated, the Lead Civic is dedicated to getting, looking into historic grants. We're writing the um, nomination to the um, uh, historic registry in the state, which will go to the federal, I imagine. And uh, what else can I say? Uh, Have you gone to the Community Preservation Act? Not point. yet. We, we certainly will go to the Community Preservation Act. We received $35,000 for the yeah. Stantec, the study. Yes, that for the study. The CPA, okay. But we haven't right. yet been back to the For the repairs, yeah. No. And we just got the first estimate, which is uh, 1.5, which yeah, some people think is uh, a little high. Penny, do you want to So, I mean, I want to start by saying thank you to Ned for meeting with our community group and taking into consideration some of our concerns. You know, we don't like that it has to be closed, but, you know, safety is fairly important. Mm -hmm. And we really didn't want to see it become even more of an eyesore, looking like an abandoned neighborhood. And so we appreciated, Ned, thank you at least for, instead of putting up aluminum colored chain link fence, he put up black that kind of disappears and he's going to bring us some dirt that we can put in some planters and make it look not so derelict well and to remind us all that we are working on this, that this is going to be wonderful. So the other thing we did is that we went down to Simsbury where they have an old iron bridge, not quite as old as ours, but the same general construction and type and got some inspiration from them when it was closed, when they built a new bridge. And so I have brought some photos of that bridge so that you can, and, and our meeting with them, really so that you can be inspired. Oh, you have them. I'll just pass them. Take one, you know, look at one and pass them around. Sure. Mm -hmm. And in the, at the, the last thing is a newspaper article out of the Hartford Current. They came over and did a story on it. So one of the pictures in there illustrates how they raise money to maintain the bridge. They have all these flower boxes. Originally they started with four that were built by the guys in the shop, or the students in the shop. And they sell 
the right to put your name tag on, on them by the year. So the first one, $75 for the first year. If you want to continue it, it's $45 a year, maybe it's 48 but. And they have more subscribers than they have <coughs> baskets and, and boxes for. And you'll see they have a lot of boxes. So we are also you know, thinking about how can this be funded. So with some, with some nudging from Ned, we're hoping to get some engineering students to start with an engineering study so that when funds come, come up that might be used, we'll be shovel ready. We're hoping that maybe the Greenway, some of us are working on both projects, the Greenway project, this, this is in a good location to be part of that Greenway, and maybe some of those funds can be used to enhance this bridge and make it safe for pedestrians and bicycles. So it's exciting, and we hope you all get excited about it too. Great. I'd like to share some notes that I have, just to get a little bit more of the history. So um, this is a historic metal truss bridge. Um, and the inventory in Massachusetts lists the Hotel Bridge, um, which is also known as the Old Shepherd's Road Bridge. It's the seventh oldest in Massachusetts, and it's the oldest in Northampton. Um, it was closed to all traffic in 2004. And um, as we said, in response to an application by the LCA, in partnership with the DPW, the CPA, and City Council approved $35,000 for this evaluation of the bridge. Um, and that, that's the Stantec report that you can all take a look at that was commissioned three years ago. The report was just issued after three years. Um, this bridge was built in 1880, and um, we are looking at about 1.5, maybe 1.2 million before renovations can take place that we're going to need. Um, historically, steel trust bridges, they're um, a very central element of American history. Uh, the pres we, we also uh, found some information that the preservation of historic bridges is, has been declared by national legislation, um, congressional enforcement enactment from 40 years ago as a primary uh, goal of historic preservation in the United States. The United States has lost 50% of its steel trust bridges in the past 20 years, and so um, that's why there's, there's a real pressure to uh, preserve this one. One of the things that this, we, we know about the bridge that we found out in the Stantec report is that the bridge carries a gas line, which could um, well lend to the, the weight to call for its preservation. We have a real expert locally at UMass in the engineering department, uh, Professor Alan Lutenegger, who is an iron bridge expert, and he's a collector of iron bridge uh, pieces and he is willing to help with the engineering aspects of the application that we do for the National Register of Historic Places. Um, he also may have other ideas about preservation grants, so we have some really good resources at hand. Um, he also works with engineering students at UMass, um, so we have the Smith School of Engineering and this, the Engineering School at UMass with uh, Dr. Lutenegger as uh, kind of counsel so that we can get a shovel-ready uh, design um, so that, that will save us money is what I'm trying to say. So the things that the LCA and other Leeds residents are really interested in now from the, the DPW and the BPW to really think about is removal completely of the Jersey barriers that are up there. They're broken. There's metal coming out of them. It's dangerous. It's extremely ugly. We did um, purchase two planters, the LCA. Uh, purchase planters, the, the DPW has agreed to bring dirt for them. We have a master gardener who has volunteered time to um, plant flowers. Um, there are these, uh, what do they call those, those things that stick up the, um, the concrete barriers that you can use so that cars won't oh, oh, toss the bollards, yeah. So um, we're interested in maybe doing that, but even more, I hold on to this picture, one of the things that they've done in Simsbury is they narrow the entrance to make it clear that cars can't go onto it by planting the grass at an angle. And you can plant flowers at an angle or some kind of you know, greenery. 
and that's one way to, to narrow it. So you can put the bollards there, but you can also narrow the entrance so that cars won't come up, go up onto the, it's very really clear that it's just for pedestrians. Um, so one of the things that the LCA and other Leeds residents are interested in is making sure that this committee is behind um, an application to the Mass Historical Commission. Their grant cycle opens in March. We will be submitting a grant application to them. We'd like a supporting letter from the DPW, possibly from this committee, for that application. And that application then goes on to the National um, Register of Historic Sorry, Places. Sorry, the date. When do you need that by? Letter. It's the grant cycles in March, so then we have a we have a while. Okay. So um, one of the things, just to be clear, you yeah. might like from us. You'd like that from the DW, and maybe from this committee also a supporting. Yes. Either co-signature or separate yes. letter. Yes. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is when it comes time is just uh, support for further CPA funds to do the work. But um, as I think Sue said, we do have people looking into grant possibilities all across the country to see what we can do because this is a, you know, a rare bridge um, that needs to be preserved. Thank you. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. Wish we had even more time to see more pictures because of the length of our agenda. <laughs> I'll move along here. I'm sorry. No, no, that was great. <laughs> I think it's a great project. And, um, so, but we'll move it along since this is obviously going to come back to us yeah. a number of times. Um, so now we go to what has been listed as old business, which is the first is uh, Ned, if you want to talk about the discussion of Tree Warden and Tree Committee. Sure. <clears throat> so I've had a couple conversations with the mayor at this point as to uh, directions of where we should be going. Uh, he hasn't made a decision yet, but um, the Tree Warden, which is the Tree Committee, doesn't function properly due to a lack of a quorum almost all the time. Um, because of that, they're pretty much ineffective at the moment. So in the interim period, I offered to be the tree warden as far as if there's a public shade tree hearing, I'd be more than happy to you know, move that forward. I did them in the past when I was city engineer. So um, the big question is, is um, I know uh, Lily Lombard was pushing for a tree warden uh, independent of like they did in Amherst or a superintendent of some sort. Uh, I haven't heard anything from the mayor about funding that position or how that might work or not work. But at some point, uh, there's going to be a recommendation from the mayor as to what he wants to see going forward. Um, I think the tree warden can be the DPW like it used to be. I'm all in support of a volunteer group of a, a committee to look for funds, raising funds, securing money for tree plantings in the city, uh, develop those programs, uh, do the tree inventory, et cetera, et cetera. Just so you know, I met with the mayor today about this topic, and he's pretty clear that there's going to be a reconstituted uh, tree committee, hopefully within two months, I mean, at least the beginning of that process, and that he's seeing that new tree committee as being a group, because I know Lily came here and talked about grant writing and other things, that the tree committee, he has a, a different kind of vision for that, which he'll also come to the council with, which is the tree committee take over kind of that piece of it, which is not to have to be also kind of a de facto tree warden, mm -hmm. but it looks for grants, it organizes volunteers to do tree count. So he has a, a vision of that. And you're right, he's still in the process of thinking about, is the tree warden somebody who's going to come from internally to DPW, or do we somebody from the outside? But I think it's exciting. He'll, he'll be announcing this about the actual tree committee and really getting that started and going again. In the meantime, I think it's uh, the 9th of September. Maybe it's the 13th. It's one of those two dates. It's whatever the Saturday, the second Saturday of the month is. The um, volunteer citizen tree committee right. is moving forward with a full inventory. So, or they call it a sampling, I guess. So they pick a particular area and um, inventory all of the trees. So that's that is moving yeah. forward. I, I have a call in it. Actually, Lily called me at the beginning of this mm -hmm. meeting, and I'm hoping to get an email from. Her. Her, something that announces that, and I'll send it out to everybody in this committee and all the <coughs> counselors. She's and if we could, press release yes, tomorrow. but we're just, we could also get it to our listserv for volunteers. Here. <laughs> Anything else on this, uh, Ned? Do you have more? Oh. Ned, were you actually saying you you were a tree warden? You you could no, I did I did all the public hearings uh -huh. um, back early two thousands. But you're not a tree guy too. 
I actually I was never the tree warden. George Andikidi was the tree warden, yeah. and they <laughs> made the tree committee, which took away that responsibility. Well, you don't have that much to do, so I think <laughs> adding that, you know, sending you to train. Broad shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else on this? Okay. Oil spill into the Mill River, Nonatuck, Pine Street, Ned. So this was on the last agenda, which I was not present for that last meeting, but um, basically on May 2nd, there was a release of oil into the Mill River down on Pine Street. Uh, DEP did an investigation of it. Uh, they did a small cleanup exercise and basically have uh, said the permanent solution is gone at this point. There's no more oil there and they considered the case to be closed. They did an investigation of businesses in the area, looked around, they couldn't find where the source came from. And according to this report, they've done a number of repeat inspections. They haven't seen anything again since. Did someone do an oil change in the parking lot of the old grammar school up there? Mm -hmm. Who knows? It's a small drainage system that goes to that outfall to the Mill River, but someone put some kind of oil in it. Thank you. That was yeah. my, I had brought that up because Great. it's in Ward 7, and I was curious to hear, and thank you for sending me the report. I appreciate that. No problem. I shared that information with Ward 7 residents. Okay. Okay. Ned, you're up again on paving projects in 2014. So on our DPW website, we just have a whole slew of information on pavement management and what we're doing and our schedules of doing it and different types of pavement uh, capital work versus maintenance work and the work we're looking at doing this year. So I encourage anyone who wants to know about it, go to our website. You can download it as a PDF or just read it on site. Yeah. It's all here and it's pretty accurate and factual. and. Uh, we're actually working right now. Actually, next week we're scheduled for paving all the mill and overlays in Florence. So the project's moving right along, and um, cracks will be done starting again in September. But all the information's online. We try to have a fairly robust DPW site with information on it. Um, I've been getting lots of phone calls from Ward 7 residents about wanting to understand how decisions are made about what level is done. And mm -hmm. I've asked you and you've given me the information, I've passed it on to the particular people. But one of the things that people have suggested is if on that page there could be some kind of explanation of what the, what is mm -hmm. it called, PCI? Yep. Um, how the PCI is configured and how decisions are made based on the PCI so that they can have that question answered without, you know, individuals having to call yeah. you or me or sure, other we'll on the website. I think that would go a long way to kind of quell um, those worries that um, you know it's being decided in a some kind of non objective way. Not a problem. And in Ward seven I think that's particularly kicked up because of the paving of uh, North Main Street. People mm -hmm. were very surprised by that and felt like, you know, it's not in this bad shape and I've spent a lot of time talking to them about how um, just because of the volume of traffic and all of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Those are things that are configured into the PCI, and that's how decisions get made that, you know, people aren't necessarily aware of. Right. There's an overview on the webpage also that discusses why we do million overlaying versus reclaiming streets versus crack ceiling. So that's on the website already also. If people can navigate around, they'll find probably pretty much everything they're looking for. But we can put an extra blurb in front about that. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Pesticide reduction in Northampton. That is just um, to give folks an update. We haven't um, moved much further along. Um, it's not been made official that this pesticide reduction task force is going to be convened, but it is going to be convened uh, most likely in September. Um, there, we've identified 15 um, members that will be invited representing, I think, four city committees or commissions, um, several departments, of course, DPW, DPW being one of them. Um, it will be, I think, co-chaired by the Board of Health and uh, city councilors. Um, and we have, we're right now working on developing what the, the kind of uh, charge is going to be, the exact charge is going to be for the commission and how long it will last, the task force will be and how long it will last. Um, and I can answer any questions that people might have, but uh, again, it's not yet been made 
official. The announcement hasn't been I do have a question. Yet. So when you say 15 people kind of approximately have been identified, who is working on that piece? Was that the mayor with some The mayor, subcommittee? the board of health, and me okay. as the person Great. who initiated Thanks. it. And this is a this is a mayoral task force. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Looks like we were going to be here till six thirty. <laughs> yeah, we're not done. Okay, so now uh, back to Ned. We're mowing at the community gardens. So this was brought up last time. I've talked to Rich Parsley. I talked to William Sullivan, who's in charge of parks and cemeteries. They don't understand what I'm asking about mowing alongside community gardens. According to uh, Mr. Sullivan, all we do is turn the water on and off and blow out the water lines every season. So we don't do any mowing up there. So I'm not sure why public works would tell someone not to mow. So everyone's okay. kind of a little miffed as to why this is coming up as it, I, I actually put that on the agenda because I got two calls from folks living up there asking me about mowing there and saying, so I said, I'll bring it up to the meeting and you just gave me an answer, which I'll get back to them yeah. and say, hey. I've had those questions too, right? I, 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 You're talking about community gardens at the state hospital, correct? Okay, no, I, I'm confused. <laughs> this is the state hospital. You have had other mowing questions. Other mowing questions, but that I've addressed them then. I was just wondering. But I'll bring that answer back. Yeah, I just I, wanted to. Uh, Mr. Sullivan said you talked to his crew. They said that that's never happened. So they've never told anybody. Yeah, not that's. To mow I'm there. not sure where this conversation started. Okay. What happened? So it's but individuals with their own individuals saying growing. no, no. It's individ from the out. It's out. I think it's outside the community garden, around the side. Or we mowing around the sides of the community gardens or not? Not that I'm aware. And if of. somebody wanted to mow out there, live next door, nobody. Would have said, "Hey, stop!" I stop don't stop doing people mowing the green belt in front of their house. Yeah. <laughs> Can someone explain what you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Could someone explain what you're talking about? Yes, um, I got a call and, and a, then a couple of emails. And there were three people. I forget the names of the folks, um, and they said there were a number of us living near the community gardens, and that we used to do some mowing or some clipping or something on the outskirts, not the in the gardens. No, these are individuals, oh, residents. Individuals. And that they were told by the DPW, supposedly, to stop doing that. To stop mowing around the edge of the community gardens? Yeah, because it's not their land or something. Now, that could have been anybody. <laughs> I've never heard of impersonating. Is there a fine of impersonating a DPW? <laughs> <laughs> a we should have an ordinance yeah. on that. Yeah. But so now I'll get back to them. I just put it on the agenda and I'll say, look, nobody from the DPW is instructed to do that. It's not policy. If anybody did, we haven't heard about it. And so go ahead. You want to beautify that area? If they can identify the people, maybe they can bring it. Yeah, down. I will do yeah, that. I will get back to them. I'll find that. I said, I couldn't get any information on it. Maybe they want to mow some other things, too. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'll feel <laughs> it. You're along. We'll take a, make a list. OK. Thank you, Ned. Yep. Um, Sidewalk conditions and ordinance pertaining to obstructions. That again. So I read through the minutes of the last meeting. Apparently, you're looking for how to describe what an obstruction is. That's what I got from the meeting minutes. Well, yeah, so simply, yeah. but I mean, but, but what we were talking about was, um, well, Mr. Lapiansky has, um, feels that a lot of sidewalks are obstructed. And um, we're not sure, you know, to what level it's being the, the ordinance is being enforced. And I was curious about um, how the ordinance has been functioning because I noticed that the BPW, the ordinance says BPW. I think it's really um, staff of, in the DPW. Yes, the staff. Yeah, but the ordinance says BPW, but I understand the way it functions that the staff of the DPW actually decides, de determines what an obstruction is. But I noticed in reading the ordinance that um, it gives the the the, deep, the, the well, it says BPW, the DPW, the authority to. Um, define what an obstruction is, mm -hmm. and then enforce it. So I wanted to ask you um, how you have how you have defined obstructions in the past and, and dealt with it. Well, let me give you a little history. In 2014, we've had two to date. 2013, there was one certified letter that went out from uh, the DPW. 2012, 11, 10, where no letters went out. Um, in 2009 and 2008, there was one letter each year. In 2006, there was three letters. In 2005, there was two letters that went out. Okay, well, well I guess my question is, certainly there are obstructions out there. Then how, how is this obstruction defined? It's defined by staff going out there and basically is there a tree branch that's coming out or 
bushes that are engulfing a good part of the sidewalk that people can't walk on it where they go around. Most recently we had an incident up on Gilrain Terrace where they actually, uh, the bank that owns the house actually came out and took the whole entire edge road out. Because you can see the walking path going outside the block around the fire hydrant to come back on the walk again. So basically it's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of the judgment call on behalf of the department as to is an obstruction eye. Can someone walk on there without being clipped on their head or do they have to either reduce to less than three feet in width, which is ADA compliance, is one thing we also look at. Some of the older sidewalks in the city are three feet, some are four feet. Newer standard sidewalks are five and a half feet. So we got this mixed bag of sidewalks across the city too in the widths. So, you know, it's kind of a judgment call, but we don't get a lot of them. They're usually residential complaints that we deal with. And most time we do a courtesy knock or a courtesy call first and see if we can get a hold of them. Most times it's taken care of. We only write a letter when it's not taken care of. And they do go out certified. Um, so uh, how does it work? Does like when there are workers out there, they just determine themselves. Who I mean, who who out actually out there? Because I doubt. I'm guessing one, they wouldn't ask you about it. Someone would make the decision. The call and usually there. comes to me. Oh, I usually assign okay. it to one of the engineers to go out there and take a look at it. Bring me back a photo so I can take a look at it. Gilrain Terrace. I have to drive on my way home that way to take a look at it. So in other words, you're not taking a yardstick and measuring exactly how much sidewalk is passing. I don't have a yardstick in my truck, no. <laughs> <laughs> because that was kind of where the discussion went in mm -hmm. the last meeting. But what percentage, so in 2014 to date, you've had two complaints. That's correct. Those are the number of complaints investigated, or the, those are the number that were called in? Those are the number that were called in and looked at. Does that include the one that I emailed the department about at the corner of Bridge Road and Elizabeth? I never got an answer back, but I... I don't know offhand. I know one of them was Gilbane Terrace. Do you have any information about the, um, the ADA compliance? Um, legislation around that because one of the points that I was making when we had the discussion last time is that what seems to me that it's not necessary for Northampton to legislate and measure, you know, some kind of measurement of what, what needs to be obstructed and what doesn't mm -hmm. when we have ADA mm -hmm. compliance that we have to um, mm -hmm. abide by anyway, mm -hmm. which I believe mm -hmm. is um, the width of the size of a large size wheelchair, which to me feels adequate, and that's where I think there was some um, breakdown in the conversation. ADA compliance is three feet at pinch points. You know, <laughs> telephone pole, there's a lot of telephone poles and sidewalks, there's some mailboxes that encroach a little bit, but that's what they consider three feet minimum at all times. How does a, how does a, um, a homeowner know when they're obstructing if there's no definition of obstruction? I usually tell them they're obstructing. Well, right. But, I mean, my point is, how would they objectively know if they don't get a call from you? Um, don't know. The department, the, the Board of Public Works should have a definition if they're the ones tasked with it. You can go to Webster Dictionary and find the definition of, of obstruction, but that's what we I mean, want that's to use. Suspicious, but I mean, they're really, I mean, you, I think people, I, I think it really, you know, I mean, we could it seems like there's a something. completely whimsical. Mm -hmm. and I mean, it's completely up to whatever you think an obstruction is. So, you know, I mean, that's that's the point, one of the points. But, um, you know, I think Mr. Lapiansky can show you numerous examples of something that a reasonable person would think obstruction is, mm -hmm. but the but but the but the um, but it's undefined in the ordinance. I mean, you, I, I guess you think it's self-evident. I disagree. In all cases, I don't think it's always self-evident. Councilor Spector, do you have the... Um, the notations of that that I brought you a month ago? That you brought here? Correct. We, did you send them to us as well? I don't remember. Um, but I, I don't have them unless, unless we kept them. I, I didn't I intend for that to be a list of complaints, so that's okay. I was just yeah. wondering. I'm sure you have it somewhere. Um, I, did, I did actually bring a copy of, of the notes that I had made when I did it, but basically, Ned, you weren't here. What I brought at the last meeting was a list of, I think, around 750 
obstructions that I observed by personally surveying about half or more than half of the sidewalks in the okay. city. Um, and they ranged from obstructions that no one would complain about to complete obstructions that have been there for years that no one has complained about. Mm -hmm. um, I have chosen not to make any complaints this year during this process because I wanted to let the actual process play out and not try to sabotage it. Um, if the policy remains the same, possibly in the fall, but certainly next year, I would start complaining about ones that bothered me. Mm -hmm. I do believe that if any changes were made, it should remain that citizen complaints are the basis for it, because if it's not bothering anyone, we shouldn't force someone to do something. I also think that the compliance period is too small, 14 days. Um, most of the obstructions are by, are by plants. Plants grow most in the summer. That's when people are often away for more than 14 days, and I think that it should be expanded to at least 30 days, if not 60. That's something that can be done to ordinance committee. But having a definition of obstruction is fundamental because if you don't, okay, so we can find we can work on a definition. And that, how long will that take? When do you like it done? As soon as possible. Well, it has to go through city council, so it's going to be months in the process to do that. No, it wouldn't because the ordinance says that you can find. So if you wrote up a definition that you, I'll work to with Terry on this. We could. Can you do it by the next meeting? Our next meeting is next week. Maybe no, the not. next BPW City Council this meeting. Yeah. Oh, this yeah, meeting. sure. Yeah. Which I would think September or? Uh, it would probably be this uh, Tuesday, first Monday. First Monday, but that, okay. is that later? No, it's the second Monday. Second Monday. Second Monday. Is the second Monday Labor Day? It's, I think this month was kind of a special. We it was. The, we yeah. moved it to the yeah. first. We did. We can work on that. Okay. So we'd be meeting on we'd be meeting on the eighth, which is our normal meeting. I'd just like to say again that I think that um, with the ADA, I mean, the ADA should be kind of an overarching kind of guiding principle there, and since that's already a federal law, it seems to me that we have that as a good place to begin. Yeah. That makes sense. Any other comments? Well, I, I think that it should be included, uh, and I, I did say this at the last meeting, but tax fairness, right? Taxpayers pay for sidewalks when they are built. They're not often maintained, but that's not really the point here. For instance, on Con Street, a specific decision was made to make the sidewalks wider. If the taxpayers, which of course I'm one, we all are, pay for more a wider sidewalk, right? Five feet instead of the previous three feet and obstruction up until there's three feet left is acceptable, then what are we paying for? We're not really paying for a, 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 an additional width of the sidewalk. And so there should be some relationship, at the very least, if, if not written into an ordinance, which would be my preference, but I think there should be some relationship between how much money we spend on wider sidewalks and whether we're willing to enforce obstruction to the full width, which in Amherst, the ordinance says you can't obstruct any of the sidewalk. And it's not fully enforced because it's based on complaints. But in Amherst, it says, I, I believe, it, I was given a, a rundown, not a reading of the ordinance, but I believe it must say the sidewalk cannot be obstructed in all or in part, otherwise they wouldn't be able to do that. Um, so I, I think there's definitely value in relating it to the width because we spend money on it as a city and funds are limited. Mm -hmm. and I think you. Okay. Ned, I want to thank you and your department for making the area that you were talking about on Gilrain Terrace. Um, I received a call just last week from the principal, very pleased to see we have a sidewalk back. And um, Councilor Adams, I just wanted to let you know, at that site, it was extremely dangerous. There was arborvitaes that were never taken care of. They took over the sidewalk. I even came in to see Ned with a resident. 
So many people had concerns, but it was the children. The sidewalks are not wide, they're small. There was no more sidewalk left. The trees actually took over the sidewalk, and our children going to Ryan Road School had to go around a fire hydrant on the corner of the road. That's unacceptable, and I agree with you. I do have residents with wheelchairs. They couldn't even use that. Okay, so you guys are gonna look at my yeah. for that. I'm gonna work on that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So we will define obstruction so that there's a nice, clear, Perfect. unambiguous. Great. And okay. if, I, yep. if I want to follow up with either of you, which of you should I contact? You could uh, send me an email or? So you are supposed to net, that was the question. Last on the agenda, private ways center court. Your backup, it's been it's been bad. <coughs> Back and um, so I am late to this game. I know that this was in the last session of council. Um, that's when this all started. The question of private ways, but um, we have. Uh, an owner of property on Center Court that is um, talking to all of the counselors, very concerned about the fact that Center Court wasn't uh, approved as a public way. Um, so I just wanted to get a little bit of background on the process, the decision making, what it would take to reopen uh, the possibility of Center Court being considered again um, for recognition as a public way. Can I start to just, I want to start because I want to praise these guys that have been involved with this for years and watching you guys do the process from way back when none of us want to remember <laughs> this would come up eight years ago. <laughs> it was actually when Ray was here, when Ray Labarge was here, so we would bring this up. We were like, okay, let, let's leave that. It was tabled multiple times. And I never thought, thought this is just going to be so difficult politically so hard to decide who gets this and who doesn't. So I just wanted to start by praising because the process I saw was an example of how things like this should be done and that this committee created a very clear list of criteria with what do you need in order to be moved from a private way to become a public street and listed those so that it took it out of the realm and you guys know I too from my ward tried to apply whatever political pressure I could, <coughs> Council Labarge did, and you guys were great. You looked at that, and they had a list, and they had a set of criteria. And, and I think from the outside it looked like you bent over backwards to include as many streets as you could. So you erred on the side of if it was a question, if it was close call, you said, we're going to make it, we're going to ask the City Council, prove this is a public street. And so I just want to say there was that criteria. That was the process. And they would go and look, and then they would talk to residents. I met with you a few times with my residents where they were contesting a street that looked like it wasn't going to be, um, you know, get your approval. And they listened, and they changed it. So, And they didn't do that in every case, but I saw you do that in most cases. And so that's just background on watching them from the outside. And then I'll turn it over to you guys. So. The criteria we established um, were, in a sense, undermined in several cases because the city council in previous years, sometimes going back into the 60s, had clearly determined that they would accept a street. And so once that had occurred on a street that didn't meet our criteria, we circled back and looked at other similar streets and said, well, we can't very well accept this street, which we would do because the city council had indicated they wanted to and then not accept that street, which is similar in every respect. The streets we finally have the hardest time with are ones where there's no clear off-street parking. Ned and I have gone back since um, this has all come up again and stood there looking around. Center Court is a parking lot with an outlet on the street. <clears throat> Even if you stand there and say, what could the residents do? What could they possibly do that would give us a chance to say yes. It's hard to imagine what it would be. It's very amorphous. Cars are just all over the place. Sometimes I've seen in excess of 15 cars parked here and there all over the... And if we say, okay, there's a snow emergency and they must now get off the street, where would they go? We thought we could perhaps ask the uh, owners of property on that street to put in curbs. It's hard to imagine what the curbs would look like. Even if you were say, given a 
clean sheet of paper and say, draw it any way you want. It's hard to see any way to make it work. Uh, there are some other issues in there. There's a, a big low spot back by that big tree. Um, there's some drain. There's semi-private utilities. Is it? We have a city water line in there, and that's it. <clears throat> so they are connected to the sewers, but it's a little bit of a Mickey Mouse arrangement. Um, it's just a complicated street to take over. It's a parking lot. Uh, okay, that's. It, it, <clears throat> We're not unsympathetic. That, that's infill of a desirable kind in the Central Business District. I mean, there's a lot to like about those buildings. It's, it's a cute little neighborhood. Um, we're not unsympathetic to the, the problem. We just can't see a way forward. So it's primarily the parking, the off-street parking issue is what the barrier is, is what it sounds like you're saying. It's, it's, it's the barrier, it's the parking, mm -hmm. it's defining a street. And when you, the street width is probably going to be no greater than 15 feet in width at best. It's just not enough room, which is basically no, no two cars can pass at the same time. Mm -hmm. And when you have no parking, you have to sign it. So well, how do you sign it? I'll sign to the middle of a parking lot, trying to define the roadway. If we put berms out there, try to define it, it's going to trap water in those parking lots because there is no drainage in there at all. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just a lot of moving parts that don't come together. Yeah. Whereas if, it, if a private power goes in there, people, they can work with people, move the cars around. You know, it'll take a while, but they can, there's nowhere to push the snow. They have to, there's a little bit of a dance there, moving cars to push snow, put the car back, and then do this one. It's, it's not a, in our view, and, and please chime in, but it's not in our view an appropriate municipal service to be working like that. So what I'm being told by this particular individual is that they're at its most narrow point, the street is 18, between 18 and 19 feet, which is uh, wider than some city streets, publicly recognized. Um, city streets, there's a commercial aspect to the street, it's right in the core of the city, um, and they feel that they need an abatement on taxes if, um, in fact, it's not going to be recognized as a public way. So <coughs> I'd be curious to hear how your rejoinder to all of that. I'd like my driveway cloud. <laughs> <laughs> it's private property. Straight, straight up, done deal, private property. I think, I think it's. I think the abatement it's issue is a, a touchy issue. I mean, it's. And what would be the basis? Um, out of the streets that are recommended to be taken, I, I, I do believe that you pointed out some of these points. I do believe you'd be hard pressed to find any street with that level of, of uh, with that much business in it. And um, and if, would you be? I mean, you can answer this question probably. Out of the streets that you're recommending for taking, most of them don't have businesses on them. Is that is that right? The majority the of them are residential. Yeah, that's true. I, I would guess them. Vast majority. If there are other ones with, with business in them, with business on the street. Depot Avenue is the only one that comes to yeah. mind. I'm sorry, which one? Depot Avenue, the back of Florence Savings yeah. Bank. Florence Bank. Oh. And the yeah. Christian. Uh, That's another store. one that you recommended for non taking that has. For taking, no, for, for converting as a public way. For converting as a public yeah. way that has. Okay. This one has you know a good amount of business in it. Um, it's it's mixed use as you pointed out, and wh I mean I I see that by your criteria that. Um, some of the factors are absent, but some of them are quite present, like being centrally located, like being located on on, cent on centers between center and Gothic, which are two main streets, which are both connected to the main street of the entire city. Um, it's directly in the middle of the city, and it also has businesses. It's mixed use. Um, so, you know, I, it sounds like those factors don't weigh as heavily for whatever reason, but I weigh those factors very heavily. And also, you know, as a matter of fairness, I mean, the, the, you know, the BPW doesn't plow our private driveways, but but they've relied on this for a very long time, and they are unique in their central location and the fact that there is a lot of business on a, for a tiny street. It's, it's it's full of businesses and residences. So, I think that I do think that this is this is a, a unique type of street, but I hope that it doesn't get taken as a public way. So, I went there. Uh, I forgot the name of the person, but he brought me there, and I was there. I, I think he wished he hadn't, because when I was there that day, first of all, 
one of the things, if you go to Depot, for example, that, that feels like a street, right? You go to Depot where there's some business. That, it's like, I can't even believe that wasn't a street. It has entrances and exits. People are going up and down the street. So he brings you there and someone parked right in the middle. It's like, I just thought the person was like, I, I want to check up on them. They stopped and got out. And I was like, well, if this is a street, people are just parking in the middle. Now, I think that was probably unique. But somebody got out of their car, went somewhere, and left their car, and it felt to me, it's a feeling. So these guys have more criteria, but if you go there and hang out there, see if any cars are actually going through from those two streets. I agree it's centrally located, but so are other places that have parking lots in the back. It's not a through it's street. It's not a through it's street. Not a through, well, yeah, so it's, it's not a through street. It's, but no one's going, I don't see people even going in there to look for other parking. It's not the kind, it feels very much like a little enclave. Like, I live here, this is my parking space here. I certainly wouldn't go in there. Maybe I should go in there looking for parking when things are busy. But it just doesn't have that sense to it. It has the sense of this is our little place, and I agree, it's very nice. But I don't see how, when, when we have taken care of in the past, how have we done plowing in, in the past there? With a small truck. I, I think there's a little bit of a catch-22 in here, though, because on the one hand, the reason, I mean, the reason it, it is so densely parked is that there are a ton of businesses. I mean, there's 25 some odd therapists that work in that, on that little street, in that enclave, and because of that, you know, there's a lot of parking in the street. I, we, you know, we need to value those kinds of businesses in our downtown, and I think that one of the ways that we can value them is also support the business owners um, that have their businesses there by providing But the reason services. this whole discussion started years ago mm -hmm. was we were plowing and doing work on people's driveways mm -hmm. who have like three houses at the end of a quarter mile driveway mm -hmm. and we're plowing, it was a driveway, there were one or two houses, one was one house mm -hmm. and I remember one of the reasons we brought this up was here was somebody who had, we've been taking care of this quarter mile of a dirt road, plowing to this person's house, it wasn't, it was a private way, but we're plowing it because we always had. And what came up was somebody who was going to build there wanted to have a right of way to go over it and this person wouldn't allow them to do it. At that point we're saying, what is this, we're taking care of this street and they won't let them in. And so we started looking at this because we started having other communities, for example, the co-housing community, um, I think it was the, the first one, um, Mountain, Mount Mount Laurel. Laurel. Mount Laurel. They have, what well, actually this looks more like a street yeah. than a lot of streets. They have a street up to 20, I don't know, 25 units. They're like 25 families there, probably 80 people living there. And they have a very nice, very wide street. We don't plow that. We don't touch that. We call that a private way. You take care of it yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, there are more people living there than some of the other streets we've mm -hmm. called, but we made a decision. So mm -hmm. what we looked at was, historically, what happened was, somewhere in 1947, some counselor, I mean, Ray used to, Ray had this information, some counselor got a call and said, hey, you know, when it was much more like Ned Huntley was my cousin, and hey, Ned, why don't you have the city plow the streets? So they start plowing it in 1947. They do it in 1948. They're doing it in 1949. Now they're doing it in 19, 2010. And so we're starting to look at that. How did this ever come to be? And it came to be from what was once a small town. And we had to kind of look at, yes, every, I mean, it was really hard to do this. Because once people, one of the arguments I made with you guys over and over was, once somebody has something done, for years and years, it is really painful to take it away because you expect it, especially if you move in there or you bought the property, you buy the property. I mean, I feel for these people. They bought it thinking it's being taken care of. One reason I'm a little less sympathetic here is, as you point out, there's like, there are a lot of, there's like 20 something therapists. There are a bunch of people living there. I don't see it as a huge burden for them Again, we have to send out a small truck for them to say, look, okay, so when it does snow here, collectively the 40, 50, like they do at co-housing, or even more adults living here, to say, we'll take care of this. So at some point, we have to draw the line. Because I think we have the same arguments in, in some of these other places where we say we're not going to go ahead and keep plowing. So I just want to make a point about the process. When, they, when the petitions come in to have a public way done. It goes to the city council first. 
they don't have to accept it. They can say no right there on the spot and not recommend it down to the Board of Public Works or the Planning Board for yeah. approval. That's your choice. So far, all of them have come down to us. Recommendations are being made, sent back up. As City Council, you still have the right to override. Yep. You had the final vote. So even though the Board of Public Works, the Planning Board said no to Senate Court, City Council can direct the department to create a layout plan and make it a public way. Just that I'm scratching my head, how are we going to make this a public way and make it function like a public way? Um, this came before, well, it was on the council agenda, but we never ended up voting on, voting on it, if I remember correctly, because I, I checked the, uh, the minutes from when it came to the council last year. And they were all withdrawn before a vote because you're going to make a further, you're going to have further discussions and make you know, um, reconsideration of recommendations. So when should we expect it again? Well, Terry and I were talking about it last week, trying to figure this out again, and we're, the, the vote is still no by the Board of Public Works. But, so, but aren't you going to present the will be formalized in writing to you. Just that when we started doing this, Senate Court and Bradford Street South were the two streets that first received their no's, and we actually sent that to the City Council probably a year ago, and then we decided, let's get through all the public way process completely wrap it up before we send these letters back to the city council. And that's where we're at now. We're winding the process down of all the public ways. We're getting the documents from Alan Seawall to bring to city council uh, as far as packages of deed research, the order of taking mylars and so on like you did for uh, the Bradford Streets the other day. That's what we're in the process of finalizing all these documents now. So it sounds like, uh, you know, I'm asking when we'll, we should expect it. This uh, handful of months, maybe this fall at some point. Not to uh, I'm to planning it, well before winter. That's my, okay. that's okay. my okay. goal. Alan Seawald uh, told me the other day that he anticipates having all the legal work done by October. Okay, thank you. Good. And, and just so, for those who don't know, we never wanted to address this. This this was dropped <laughs> on our lap by a state court decision. We didn't want to do this. I think everybody would have liked to just continue to plow Uncle Joe's <laughs> mile driveway and be done. <laughs> Anything else on this? Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's the end of our agenda, unless anything has come up that couldn't have been anticipated. Motion to adjourn. Second. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, everyone.